Welcome to another episode of The Mighty Oak Show. Again, so glad to have you with us today. Looking forward to a wonderful conversation. But before we jump into that, I want to remind you, if you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that, subscribe. And then after you subscribe, go on over to that link that allows you to know when our content comes online. Uh, we have had a busy season of recording content and it's all been great and it's all for you. Uh, it's not for us, it's for you. We produce content that we believe will be a help and a blessing to you and to those that you know that may be in need of this. Um, it's interesting, I've had this conversation actually several times over the last couple of weeks about our content and how so much of our content, although we produce it really from the context of the military life or the veteran, those who are dealing with a particular type of trauma in their lives, uh, the, the conversations that we have really apply to everyone. We know this. We know that trauma is not reserved for veterans. Trauma is something that every human being who's ever been alive can relate to. Big trauma, little trauma, it's all trauma. And so much of what we talk about is how to move forward in the face of that. So go ahead and subscribe if you have not. Make sure you've hit the notification link and share this out to those that you know who, uh, who might need this. And uh, that'll be a help to you if you're listening via podcast or over at Mojo Five O. Thank you for listening, but take some time later on to go to YouTube. And that would be awesome. Our guest today is uh, someone that I've known for the last uh, several years, uh, four or five years, I would imagine. Uh, but we haven't had the opportunity to do the show today. Dr. Damon Friedman is our guest. He is the founder of SOF Mission, and uh, he just recently released a book, Igniting Movements. We'll talk about that as well. But uh, so much of what he does is right in line with what we as Mighty Oaks do. In fact, uh, we have a handful of partners, um, and, and partner is defined very loosely in our world. But uh, there are also those that we link arms with and move forward together with, and uh, Damon and SOF Mission, and their, uh, their work is definitely that to us. So Damon, thank you for taking the time to be on with us. It is, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, it's taken us a while to kind of work out the timing, but here we are. So thanks for doing it. Yeah, well, Jeremy, super honored to be here. Love what you and Mighty Oaks are, are doing. Uh, we've been partnering for, for quite a while now, uh, helping uh, our warriors get back on their feet. What you guys are doing is extraordinary. And uh, just, really, just really happy to be here with you. You're a phenomenal leader. You're doing some great work out there and praying for you and the team all the time, especially during this crazy pandemic yeah. craze happening, you know, and so... Uh, our, 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 our warriors are more isolated than ever. So your work uh, uh, and us working together as a collective is more, it's critical now yeah. more than ever. So thanks a lot, Jeremy, for having me on and uh, being able to be a, a resource for those out there that are uh, um, part of the audience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. Um, yeah. What a time to, uh, to do the work that we do. It's, it's crazy that, um, you know, you and I, our organizations would probably say something very similar the worst thing you can do as a veteran or someone struggling with trauma is isolate yourself. And here we are in a government imposed isolation. <laughs> and so uh, all of us are trying to deal with this. I know you guys have, have taken a unique approach to that and, uh, and we have as well. Um, we'll get into your story, but, but talk about that for a second. What are some of the ways you've dealt with this period of time as you've continued to serve veterans? Yeah, so what we did was uh, in order to pivot to the, what we call the COVID craze, yeah. <laughs> uh, is, is we, we went old school humanitarian mission style. What we did was uh, we partnered with a lot of, uh, with the American Legion and uh, Papa John's wow. and uh, throughout the whole state of Florida. And what we did was we, we made COVID care kits. And in those COVID care kits, uh, we put masks and gloves and hand sanitizers and wipes and things like that. And in it, we also put Papa John's pizza. I nice. mean, uh, all the owners, all the way from the panhandle down <laughs> yeah. uh, to Miami really uh, partnered with us and we put in one free uh, pizza in it. And then nice. uh, depending on the audience, yeah. uh, you know, we would put some popcorn, maybe some chocolate goodies. Uh, you know, if it was a, a, a retirement home, uh, we would put in some, some uh, socks. Uh, so, uh, and we focused it at risk veterans. Uh, and so we, we gathered together with a bunch of leaders throughout the state of Florida and we packaged over a thousand COVID care kits yeah. and, we, and we had those delivered. That was pretty awesome because we got reconnected yeah. to a lot of the veterans that are out there. And sometimes you just have to, uh, you have to really be flexible, think outside the box. And, uh, and some really some goodness that happened from it is the emerging of a Veterans Coalition of Florida and really, it's just an informal uh, group of nonprofits coming together. And so now, 
Every month we're doing a Zoom promoting the resources that are available to Florida veterans. So it's, it's really cool. We just started, we just had our uh, first one just this last month and it was boom and it was on live on Facebook. So really, you know, sometimes you just have to be creative and, yeah. and it's been such goodness. So God really blessed us on that. So that's how we. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's awesome. You know, you think about the things you just mentioned in that in that box, and as happy as probably anyone would be to get all of those things, uh, it's really not about those things. Particularly when you're dealing with at-risk veterans, right? It's really about making a connection and communicating. In spite of everything else going on in the world, there are people who care about you right now, and I think that's uh, that's why it's important to do. And I, I say this all the time: do what you can, <laughs> whether you're an organization that can box a thousand of these. Or you're an individual who can walk across the street and say to someone who is at risk, uh, I care about you, I'm here for you, what do you need? It's really that connection that's the important part in all of that. One, one of the cool things though, Jeremy, with that is, is that for every COVID care kit, we actually put the message of hope in it. So it wasn't just giving them some goodies, you right. know, and yeah, letting sure. them know what resources right. are available, but we put in our, our film, Surrender Only to One, uh, which uh, won six national awards and nice. in it. Uh, plus a, a, an electronic discussion guide for it. And I'll tell you what, in that message, it's six, it's the stories of six operators or six, you know, military members uh, signing on the bottom line, taking the oath, going to war, and then coming back, dealing with the implications of combat. Yeah. But then how ultimately in the dark, darkest of times, um, you know, the commander of the universe, you know, King uh, Jesus shows up right. and, uh, and uh, extracts him out of that kill zone. So yeah. it's a really powerful message. And so we were able to distribute uh, you know, thousands of those. So we were really excited about it. So these COVID care kits uh, are, were multidimensional because we want to make sure people know out there that there is hope and that yeah. hope is in. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's jump into, uh, let's jump into your story. So um, start, you know, wherever you'd like to, but uh, you know, I just finished reading your book and you started kind of growing up in Los Angeles, going into the Marine Corps, making the worst decision of your life to transition to the Air Force out of the Marine Corps. Why anyone would do that, I have no idea. But you did that, uh, served for uh, 20 years in special operations, and in that process started uh, SOF Mission and now doing many of the things you're doing now. Uh, tell us that story, and I'd love to hear the faith aspect of that as you kind of unpack that for us. Yeah, so um, you know, every, every one of our warriors' uh, story is unique, but uh, those that find hope, it, it always ends the same. Uh, and for me, you know, being raised in... Um, born in downtown Los Angeles. I had an extraordinary mother, uh, single mother. My biological father was very, very abusive, psychologically, physically, spiritually. I mean, he is, um, you know, probably, you know, the worst father I, I could possibly imagine. And for most as well, we moved uh, 14 different times in the first 12 years of our lives because we, uh, we were running away from him. And uh, so, uh, through in Los Angeles, we lived in low income housing. We uh, even at one point lived in the projects and my mom worked around the clock to put uh, rice and beans down on the table. And uh, so that's what we ate. And it was, uh, it was really hard kind of growing up, uh, lived in the melting pot, uh, lived with uh, uh, African Americans, uh, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, um, Armenians, Cor uh, Koreans, um, Vietnamese. And so I really lived in a very um, diversified uh, area um, and, and loved that piece to learn more about uh, other cultures and appreciating them for who they are. And um, when I was about 12 years old, we moved to Florida. My mom, it was a desperate attempt to finally just start a new life. My brother and I uh, were running with the wrong crowd. We uh, ended up uh, uh, breaking the law, breaking and entering, stealing, burglarizing, all that other trash. And uh, we ended up in juvie and it was there that uh, we had to make. My mom made a radical decision um, to move to Florida. And even though my juvie stint was actually in Florida, I carried my bad behaviors to Florida, but uh, it was there in that cell that I heard a voice for the first time in my life. My biological father was always telling me that I would never amount to anything, never amount to anything without him. And all of a sudden, you know, for the first time I'm in this cell and I'm thinking there's got to be something more to life than all of this. There's got to be, I, I have to, I, I mean, there's got to be something more than all of this. And it was there in that cell where I felt, uh, where I heard a voice 
And that voice said, I have plans for you, uh, plans for goodness and not for evil, uh, plans to be victorious. It was there that I, I turned a whole new leaf and I felt like it was the first time that at the point at that time, didn't know that it was God. And he spoke to me, he spoke truth in my life. And it was the first time that I, I thought to myself, you know, I, I, there's more to this. What kind of gifts do I have? And, uh, and I realized that, you know, as, a, as an adolescent, um, uh, whenever the cops were chasing me, they, uh, they never caught me. <laughs> so I, I found the gift of running. My brother and I, we started, we made a commitment to something and, and we struggled with our academics. We failed a grade, kicked out of three different schools in third grade. I mean, the, the story goes on. And, but it was in running that we found, you know, uh, the sense of purpose right. and this freedom. And, uh, and so Raymond and I, we started running 100 miles a week. And then we ended up one day, um, top runners in the state of Florida, became junior Olympians, garnered a scholarship. And then after the years of scholarships, uh, you know, running, I was the first one, my brother and I, first ones, um, you know, uh, that earned a degree. And, and when I was done, I thought to myself, uh, whenever my family was struggling and we needed a place to stay, uh, our country provided. Whenever uh, we were hungry, our country provided. Whenever I needed an education, our country provided. And so it was there that I ended up uh, making a commitment uh, to go to the United States Marine Corps. So I'm sure I could get an oorah from you, Jeremy. Yeah, on that sure. One. Well, you, you transitioned out. So I'm having a hard time with these bad decisions. These bad decisions that continue to follow you through your life. But hoorah for the decision to go in. I'm not sure about the decision to go out, but we'll talk about it later. Yeah. But no, so, so I joined the Marine Corps. And, you know, like everybody else uh, back in 2000, we didn't know what was uh, about yeah. to happen. Sure. And, of course, 2001, 9-11 occurred. And everybody uh, who was around can remember where they were on, on 9-11. Just out of curiosity, where, where were you? Do you remember where you yeah. were at? Yeah, I was on the rifle range at uh, Camp Pendleton. I was on Edson Range. Yeah, yeah so we were, uh, we were calling and got the message that, you know, the Twin Towers had been hit and all that was accompanying that. You yeah, always tell the story. One of my Marines came up to me and said, hey, sir, what does this mean for us? And I said, absolutely nothing. This is just, it's a thing. It's a blip on the screen. It won't mean anything to us. Like a year later, when we were standing in Kuwait, getting ready to push into Iraq, that same Marine walked up to me and said, so what does it mean now? I'm like, yeah, well, whatever. No, that's, that's, that's funny. I, I was in Camp Lejeune, and we were playing war games, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, big toys for big boys. And, uh, <laughs> and when, when that second um, plane hit the, the towers, we knew it was on. And like you deployed to Kuwait, I was actually in Camp, uh, Camp Fox and Task Force Tarawa, breached through through Staff One, and then, of course, raked all the way through yeah. the North, and I was a part of that team. And it was the first time that, obviously, we, we never knew we were really going to go to war, right? I mean, we'd hope to, like they're sure. training us yeah, to. Right, right. But then in the only thing I ever shot at was, uh, you know, a little green, you know, <laughs> right. uh, plastic, you know, target or whatnot. Right. And it was there in 2003, this first time I ever saw death, experienced death. Yeah. And people would ask me how that invasion was and it was literally it was like the power of military might and, and literally at zero whatever 230 the, the the night was lit as if it was day and we just decimated everything right and, it, and when i came back from that deployment i was completely different changed i i remember i could sleep like 12 hours a night and then uh i came back and i was having a the first time struggle with sleeping and it, my my wife dana was like something's wrong and, um, and of course, after 2003, I wanted to, uh, like Jeremy, uh, uh, correction, like Chad, you know, he was a recon Marine. I wanted to be a recon Marine and, and uh, I got recruited. They opened it up to all MOSs and I got recruited and, and selected to become a second force recon Marine. Yeah. In 2005, I was in that unit for a small time. And, uh, and you know, I wanted to stay in force recon. I was a Pathfinder team leader there. And... Um, and for whatever reason, uh, struggled with my monitor and wanted to bring me back to conventional forces. And sure. I really was wanting to be part of the special operations community. And at that time, Marsoc did not exist. Right. And, uh, you know, so I looked around and I thought to myself, maybe there's other opportunities. And of course, the great sin, uh, as you mentioned, Jeremy. <laughs> and uh, I don't, you know, I don't question, you know, I understand why you would question me. Uh, but then uh, I looked over and uh, looked at the different branches and I just, I really love blowing things up. I think sure. that's what you and I would agree on. Is, yep. is, 
and uh, joined, uh, looked over and looked at the SEAL programs. I looked at the SF programs. I looked at, you know, Ranger programs. And I, I, I learned about combat control and I said, this yeah. is for me. And so I crossed over into special tactics and that was the beginning of a 15 year career yeah. of, um, you know, of um, some hard, hard work. Uh, capture kill missions in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and really getting super close to the fight. Yeah. And um, so th that's, that's where it all started. Yeah. That's one of the, the smallest units in the special operations community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. And um, it, it, it's an incredible uh, job. Uh, yeah. We're all halo military free fall combat dive FAA air traffic controllers. We are also uh, um uh, demolition qualified and, yeah. and also qualified in every weapon known to man and, and vehicle known because we right. get attached to all different um, special operators. So we go overseas and we're in charge of the air to ground interface. So if an aircraft is flying over and they get in our area of operation, uh, we help uh, get them kinetic uh, yeah. and we control their uh, all the munitions and, um, and really bring some mass chaos uh, against the extreme terrorist networks. And that's what we did. So from there, um, super excited about it, um, doing, doing the nation's bidding and taking down some of the most dangerous uh, high value targets out there in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, um, and I started struggling. I, the more uh, missions, the more capture kills, the more targets, um, I started really experiencing these post-traumatic stress uh, uh, issues and, and coming back. Uh, my wife uh, started recognizing that uh, I had insomnia. I started feeling anxiety. I started feeling um, you know, um, the, the inability to kind of quote and quote, uh, cope with everyday stresses and, you know, uh, feeling, uh, um, levels of anxiety around a lot, a lot of people. And, uh, and also one of the interesting pieces, which is a new signature, uh, injury of the war that's just surfacing is a mild traumatic brain injury, which is synonymous with concussions. Right. And I just, at that time, throughout my whole 20 year career, I have five registered, uh, concussions and I've spent probably uh, approximately a year on you know in the hospital and um, on medical leave recovering from my injuries and um, and so a lot of uh, uh, blurred vision sensitive to light uh, um, um, feeling dizzy uh, all, all sorts of those things uh, I started experiencing and a lot of our physicians uh, in the Air Force uh, didn't understand that so I started dealing with the implications of combat. And so in 2010, I was in my darkest time, very similar like Chad, I, I found myself at the end of a rope. I was in a lot of pain. I didn't know what to do. And um, I got to the point where I questioned whether I should live or not. And I contemplated taking my own life. What was your, uh, what was your faith walk like at that time? Um, you know, you talk about being a young person and having an encounter with God. Um, you know, so from that point through your military career and to the point you just described, did you have a relationship with God? Was it an on again, off again type of relationship? Where were you standing at that moment? That's a really good question, Jeremy. Back in college, um, I found Jesus or Jesus found me, right? Sure. Uh, and, uh, and I made a commitment uh, to be a, a follower of Christ at the time. But you know what? I made the biggest mistake, like the majority of Christians they don't really find a place of worship. They don't really right. fellowship. They don't get connected. They don't really grow. They don't uh, study, you know, God's war manual, the yeah. Bible. Yeah. Uh, and so I was a victim to that. So in my heart, you know, I knew Jesus was King and he was Lord and savior. And, um, and, and, and I was definitely a, a part of his army. Uh, the reality is, is that I was a private first class and that's where I remained. Sure. Right. So I never grew, you know, in the art of warfare, spiritual warfare. Right. And so I ended up flailing, uh, getting my butt kicked a lot. And so, you know, when people were asking me, how was my, my faith walk at the time, I'm going to be honest with you. I think all the way up to 2010, what I was praying to God was for war. Cause I think that a lot of us, we struggle with our identity. Yeah. And when we struggle with our identity, it's like, who are we? What are we supposed to be? Well, for me, uh, for me, I wanted you to read you know, my story in a, in a history book. I wanted, yeah. I wanted people to go, man, Foxtrot November, that's my operating initials. I want to be just like that guy. I wanted to have all the awards and the accolades. I wanted to walk on in with a Mexican, you know, general like salad, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. I want everyone to be like, dude, that guy rocks, yeah. man. Who is this guy? You know? right. and, 
And so I was wrapping my identity around, you know, with the things of the world. And, uh, and so I was praying for war. Uh, you know, I was like, I just wanted that, you know, the, the mission of a lifetime. Yeah. And, uh, and so my, my faith walk really uh, wasn't there. And so, uh, you know, and, and I'll tell everybody who's out there who's listening, you better watch out what you ask for because you just may get it. And, yeah. and God gave me exactly what I wanted. I wanted the mission of a lifetime. And I'll tell you what, I almost got my butt handed to me. Yeah. And it was a seven day firefight, particularly three days where I was fighting for my life and, uh, and, um, and, and God intervened and that, that it was there that um, God met me once again, but it was different for me this time. I was like, I mean, enemies everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I reached out to God and, and I asked him uh, for, um, you know, to protect me and, and the men. And the, the only way was through, uh, um, through his divine power. And that's what happened. And we ended up getting extracted out. Yeah. All of the men, all of our men came home to their wives and to their families. And, and I made a commitment to him that if he was to save me and all of our men, that I would uh, worship him the rest of my day. So when I came home in yeah. 2010, it was there that God started really like, <laughs> you know, sifting right. through and flushing right. out, man. It was just like, yeah. and it was like the matrix. I took the red pill and then all of a sudden, <laughs> like I see the world as it is and I right. see how filthy I am right. and how much I stink. You know what I mean? And God started like just addressing a few things at a time. And that's when I really made a commitment to God. And it was there that I started growing uh, in, in, in him. So it was pretty awesome. Our guest today is someone that uh, I've been following for a long time and uh, I've been excited to talk to. And it took us, uh, the, uh, the, the vice presidential debate messed us up last week. Um, I think it messed up a lot of people last week. It was a pres presidential debate, right? Uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, messed up a lot of people. Our whole country's trying to <laughs> figure out what to do next. It's still but recuperating. That's still recuperating. Um, but uh, definitely messed up our interview. So here we are, and uh, it's awesome. Frank Sontag is with us, and uh, we're going to get Frank's story. But he is uh, currently over at uh, KKLA FM 99.5, has a radio show there, and has for a number of years. Also an author. As well as, and this is how I got to know Frank, is through uh, Kingdom Men's Gatherings. It's a uh, conference held a couple of different times a year. We'll talk about that specifically for men, to encourage men, to strengthen men, really to call men to be the warriors that God created them to be in their homes and in culture. So we'll talk some more about that. Uh, but, but Frank, your story is incredible. Um, anyhow, I'll start with thank you for being with us. I appreciate, uh, appreciate your time and taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. It's good to see you, brother. Yes, sir. Let's start. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Tell us your story, if you would. You spent um, more than twenty years uh, over at another radio station in Los Angeles, KLOS, which is uh, a rock station, and um, then accepted Christ. Came over to the Christian radio station. Can you tell us that story? Talk about where you came from, what you were into, um, and how God worked in your life to bring you to where you are today. Uh, sure. Um... I was raised Catholic. I'm Italian, dragged to church on Sunday, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. And my dad came out here in the 60s. He got a job in the movie industry and announced one day we're going to Hollywood. So I'd never been on a plane. We fly out here in the 60s. Well, you know, how can you not love the, the weather in California? Um, I begin to acclimate, went to an all boys Catholic high school, Notre Dame played sports, did all of that. But somewhere in my junior to senior year, I kind of decided I had had enough with Catholicism. And so I made the decision that I was going to go out in the world and find out what the world had for me. So I said, I'm done with church. I thought I knew who Jesus was and jumped out there. So a period of about uh, 12 years, I did a lot of things we don't need to revisit. But <laughs> in 1984, I did what a lot of young guys that are lost and trying to find identity do i went out and i bought a motorcycle sure and one particular sunday afternoon and you know jeremy i, I know you i've followed mighty oaks i love what you and chad do and everything so i'm just going to be uh, an honest transparent brother here when i tell you the story um so in 1984 i went out and bought a motorcycle I was a product of a broken home. My dad left uh, my mom when I was in high school and I just had a wound and a chip on my shoulder. So I used to get in fights and thought I knew what manhood was in that whole nine yards. And so I get a motorcycle, just trying to 
make my way through. And um, I was dating a woman who I knew um, I knew was married. I was mm. having an affair. I didn't care. I didn't know the Lord. Uh, her husband just happened to be a Los Angeles police officer. Brilliant move on my part. <laughs> and um, one Sunday afternoon in June, we went for a motorcycle ride and without all the, the details uh, in Southern Cal, where I live now, uh, freeways are pretty congested. We have gridlock, the whole nine right. yards. Well, that particular Sunday, I was riding on a motorcycle with her on the back and I went to make a lane change and I looked in the mirror. And in 1984, there were no mandatory motorcycle helmet laws. So mm -hmm. we didn't have helmets on and I, looked in my mirror and all I saw Jeremy was this car just booking on us really fast and I honestly I had the thought this is it uh, in the aftermath California Highway Patrol estimated that on impact we were hit at 110 miles an hour wow um, wow we both survived obviously I did she was hurt very badly she had to have brain surgery it was not a good time but point of the story is it was kind of a wake up call for me. Uh, I remember in the aftermath and, and I had some really weird things happen. Uh, I had no broken bones, but I was pretty uh, road rashed up and had to do all sorts of things like scrub out the asphalt and all, all the other stuff. So I was hurt more, I think, uh, emotionally. I think I had a little PTSD, didn't know it. I saw everything happen, but I decided I was going to leave LA and lock myself in a cabin in North Lake Tahoe and try to figure out what the heck happened. I All had right. survivor's guilt. Praise God she made it through, but I just felt responsible. So um, winter of 84, cabin North Lake Tahoe, just trying to piece together what's my life about. Uh, cold winter, spend months there, came back to LA, and I just fell into radio. I happened to apply for an internship at a rock station, KLOS, and um, started working on a talk show uh, of which a host was um, a, a very popular new age teacher in Southern Cal. Now, for those of you watching or listening, new age back then is a little different than now. Uh, it was more structured in that new age is kind of the the study of all faiths, all paths lead to God. It's all about love. We used to see, and every once in a while, you'll see a bumper sticker, the coexist sticker. Right. Like right. somehow it's all good. Uh, right. In the New Age Church, Jesus is relativized into being, we call him the Lord of love. But I studied under this guy. Radio opened up to me, and I actually took over his radio program. And for 21 years, I became a New Age teacher in Southern Cal with a very popular radio program. And I would do seminars and workshops all about self-improvement and just how special we are right. in the whole right. nine yards. Right. Um, so I guess to be relevant and, and somewhat timely in the story, so fast forward a number of years, I meet a woman at a lecture. She ended up being my wife. Our son was born and about a year and a half into this, my best friend had given his life to Christ. And this is a guy we did a lot of stuff with that we've repented of. But when he announced to me he had given his life to the Lord, I, my first thought was, oh my gosh, don't be one of them. I had a very bad taste in my mouth about faith, Christianity, if you will. I thought I knew what Christianity was. Right. So anyway, he and his older brother, uh, who was an evangelical pastor, after watching me for a couple of years, I ascended to the height in New Age in LA, where the LA Times ran a front page article on me and they call me a New Age guru. Wow. And Jeremy, I was buying it hook, line and sinker. Right, right. And, and I really thought on some level I was doing something spiritual. It kind of um, uh, satiated my, my deeper yearning for the purpose of life. I survived a crash I know I shouldn't have. What's life about? Who am I? Why am I here? So I was searching and somehow new age became a vehicle for more than 20 years. But this one particular afternoon, my best friend and his older brother invited me to play golf. Now, I don't know, do you play golf? I, uh, I have played golf. I'm not what you'd call a golfer. 
Golf is an evil game. It is an evil game. That's why I don't play. <laughs> it is an evil game. I'm trying to hit that little white ball on the whole nine yards. So they invite me to play, and I was playing a lot at the time. But little did I know, they had decided to, what I call, do a Christian intervention. Right, right, right. They saw me out of control. They knew I'd just been married. Our son was a year and a half. Anyway, they begin to hit me with the gospel. And I was outraged. Hmm. And I was defensive. I'm like, I'm a spiritual teacher. The LA Times just did a piece on yeah. me and the whole yeah. thing. But they both convicted me in that they got me to see, and Pastor Dale was the, the fulcrum. He said, hey, if you don't make it home today like you shouldn't have made it home 25 years ago on your motorcycle, are you right with God? And it hit me in some way by which it penetrated deeper in me. And he said, would you sit in your car and meditate on it? I was a meditation teacher, among other things. So as a new age teacher, you read a lot of the world's holy books. I read the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita. I was into Eastern mysticism, never opened a Bible. As a Catholic, we had catechism, didn't really open a Bible. So I had no scriptural reference at all. Right. And it's important of the story. So I'm sitting in my car and he said, meditate on, are you right with God? And I was kind of just quieting down and reflecting on my life. And I got very hot. And my first thought was, did I get too much sun? You know, I'm bald and didn't have a cap that day. It was sunny. I'm like, did I get too much sun? But I sat there a little longer and I felt fine other than being warm, the sensation and then um, uh, I have to throttle down here because this is something that's hard to articulate. I, um, I heard a voice um, say, are you right with me? Would you, would you submit to me? Are you ready to submit to me is literally what the voice said. Wow. And I, I knew who it was. I've said many times in my testimony at churches and other forums, when your father speaks to you, you know his voice. Mm. Um, and I had free will. I, I felt no coercion, no fear. Sure. And I said, yes. And then he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Now, we know that's biblical. That's in Luke and Mark. But I had never heard it before. I sat there a while longer. The sensation kind of passed. I called my friends and told them what happened and they're hooping and hollering and praising God. Me, I, I didn't know what happened. I right. just felt the sense to surrender. I asked Pastor Dale, do you know of a church? He said, yeah, I know a good one. I ended up going and studied uh, under Francis Chan. That was my first church. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But here's a, here's a part of the story that is um, a little iffy. In the, in the world of social media, they had put on Facebook, our good friend just gave his life to Christ. My wife, my new age wife, yeah. fell in love with a new age guru, sure. was at home and saw this post and I got home and I just was filled with the love of the Lord. I, I was convicted in a lot of ways. Honey, I'm home. <laughs> uh, my wife is uh, six foot. She's an Irish, uh, beautiful, fiery woman. And I heard her say, I'm in the front room. And I thought, uh-oh, something, something's not right. <laughs> Social media is as evil as golf. A amen. Amen. <laughs> so she had informed me. She said, don't tell me you gave your life to Christ. And I said, you know, how did you know? Yes. And she said, I, I read Facebook. And let's just say for the sake of, of testimony here, uh, we entered about an 18 month period where things were really not good. Yeah. Uh, she had mentioned the D word. Our son was a baby. Anyway, I will say after 18 months, uh, she began to come to church with me. She saw a change in me that was markedly different. And in uh, July of 2011, about a year and a half after I gave my life to Christ, she also became a follower of Jesus. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. Man, what an incredible story. Um, so many things there. Uh, I'll start with this. We are created by God to be spiritual beings, to respond spiritually to, to God, who is uh, a spirit, and speaks to us and ministers to us that way. What was it about New Age that was appealing to you, knowing that you um, 
you know, in a sense, we're rejecting Christianity with that rejecting God, but you would respond to new age. Now, I think we all want to respond to something. What was it about that that caused you to say, that's it, that's, that's what I want? The, the thing about new age, and it's now, it's our culture. Back then, we went to buildings. Now, our culture is kind of the worship of self. Mm. So in some ways, me seeking, who am I, why am I here, it kind of appealed to that sense of digging down deeper into uh, what my life was about. I, I did some pretty crazy things. I started floating in sensory deprivation tanks. I did a lot of really weird things, just challenging myself and my mind and, and who I thought I was. So new age is kind of fast and loose. You get the spiritual overtures. Um, of reading certain holy books. You kind of get appeased intellectually. God is acknowledged. But the, the whole X factor was Jesus. Yes. And, and being raised in Catholicism, in truth, and I, I think I put it in the book, I, I remember when I was six or seven years old, sitting in the church and looking up at Jesus on the cross with an excruciating look on his face. And it terrified me as a kid like so much suffering, yeah. and I kind of equated, well, that's who Jesus is, and if you are a Christian, that's the kind of relationship you have where there's a lot of um, guilt and fear, and so my relationship was a false one. Yeah. So New Age kind of gave me this sense of um, redemption where I can love God, um, tell people that it's about loving each other and just kind of weave in my philosophies, but nothing biblical or scriptural. When I became a follower and began to read God's word, I was completely convicted in my goodness. I, I was so caught up in my own ways and maybe we can talk about spiritual warfare a little bit, Sure. but it was uh, in a sense, the experience and the perception of the best of both worlds but when I did become a follower of Christ and I realized what New Age was, and I'd love to maybe get a little bit more of that with you, I realized, man, I opened some doors that I shouldn't have opened. And like I said, I had heard about spiritual warfare, but I had no idea it was what it was till I became a follower of Christ. Yeah. Talk about that for a minute, the spiritual warfare aspect. I think there is a tremendous misunderstanding of spiritual warfare. It, it, it's interesting, and, and you, don't, you can talk about this or not, but... Even as I look at what's happening culturally right now, um, it may not fall into the, you know, the quote unquote category of new age, but it is religious worship to pursue self, to pursue what I want, to burn down buildings and riot because you're not getting it. Um, to me, that's as much what you described as new age worship as anything else, but it really does come back to an underlying spiritual warfare. Uh, yes, completely. And what I look back on now, and I think God, in a sense, was preparing me for the, the worship of self, that somehow all of your standards, your morality is derived by your own thoughts on if you bring God in, yeah. you, in a sense, create him in your image versus right. the biblical truth. Right. Right. Um, but now I see what is going on in our country, where it's uh, the spirit of deception, um, outright rebellion against authority. Uh, it's demonic. I, mm. I've never seen, like I've been doing the, the program for about seven years. Just in the last few years, I've never seen evil manifest like I see it now. Right. I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm really heavily scripturally oriented, although the Bible is God's word. I, I try to be um, kind of discretionary on the program. I'm not a pastor, although I did found a, a men's ministry, but point being, um, I'm careful to not share a lot of scripture on the program because my heart is for people that aren't saved. Sure. My heart is for, for guys in the church that are jacked up and doing things they shouldn't be yep. doing, yep. but they've heard, oh, just memorize scripture or just do this or just do that. Yep. And as you know, with Mighty Oaks and all the battles you guys face, man, there's an enemy. There, there's definitely spiritual warfare. Yes. So when I became a follower in a new age, similar to the world, uh, in New Age, evil is not a force. It's just the absence of good. Mm. Um, as you know, a lot of people don't believe Satan is real. He's surely real in the Bible. Yeah. When I became a follower, goodness gracious, thank God Pastor Dale said, Frank, I just need to tell you, uh, you're a marked man now. I was 54 when I gave my life to the Lord. Wow. He said, God is going to put you on a fast track with sanctification. 
And he said, you've opened some doors that you may not be aware of. I used to do um, past life regression, all that stuff with uh, obsession with the occult and supernatural. And I wouldn't have thought uh, anything other than it's harmless. But when I became a follower, man, we had some weird things happen. I don't want to get too over spiritualizing here, but we had some dark stuff happen. And I'm like, what's going on here? And then I realized as I asked for guidance with a mentor and read the Bible, it's like I opened some doors to the demonic and didn't even know it. Right. Um, Christians right now right. may be watching. They do a little, oh, I don't know. Uh, let's go to a, a, a psychic and what's the harm or do this and that. Man, you don't want to open those doors. Yeah, Because the right. Bible clearly says there is a demonic realm and uh, even Satan masked himself as um, angel of light. Himself, a lot of way, yeah. angel of light, exactly. Yeah. So I, I see full on manifestation right now. Our country, uh, we've turned our back on God. People don't know who Jesus is. And so the manifestation is spiritual strongholds and people just kind of losing their minds and doing things that are almost undeniably. Um, Antichrist, if you will, right. and I, I use that word kind of uh, intentionally, but we are, if ever there's a time, people really need to know who Jesus is. It's yeah. now, and and there's a false narrative even in the church and in certain ministries about who Jesus is. Like yes. he's just this right. loving, compassionate, soft, kind. Right. And Jesus is a warrior. Yep, that's right. Yeah, to separate uh, the Jesus of the New Testament from the God of the Old Testament is, is in my opinion, a false gospel. The, you know, Galatians talks about a false gospel. Uh, Jesus is God, and He is a warrior, and um, there is a real war going on, and people who underestimate that. Christians seem to be, <laughs> this is beside the point, I guess, but, but Christians seem to be the ones who should know this the most clearly, or see it the most clearly, and miss it the most blatantly. It 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 blows my mind how that's the case or how it's, you know, we see that happen. Yeah, I'm not here to scapegoat pastors. They take enough hits. The church in the West takes enough hits. But sure, of course. But the truth is, I, 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 I'm concerned that even people that are steeped in the church, there's not a lot of teaching about spiritual warfare. Right, right. It's given some lip service. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God. But what does that mean? And yeah. and. Yeah, we are fighting against the principalities, principalities, et cetera, et cetera. But as you know, in Mighty Oaks, and when I started KMG, God kind of gave me a word. Uh, I'll tell you a very quick two-minute story. You know, sometimes um, one of the things I studied in New Age was a dream interpretation. And so I always had like a little journal on the side of the bed, and you have dreams, and there's all sorts of ways to interpret. But one night in particular, I had this profound dream and I, I just felt like some things were exchanged. I wrote them down and I went about my business and I remembered, wait a minute, I had that dream last night. What was I told? And sometimes in, in dream interpretation, you think you have this most profound experience and you write something down and you go back and it's like, uh, I don't know, elephants are purple, like something really <laughs> tough, like you know, nothing profound about that. Right. But this particular morning when I went back, it said, this is a battle for the hearts and souls of men. Hmm. And I really felt like it was, it, was, it was from God. And I thought, wow. And that was kind of the start of KMG. But battle is the operative word. And I've met, as you alluded to, so many men in the church. Man, there's nothing sadder than a dude that's spiritually dead, that is in a battle, that doesn't even know who the enemy is, nor how to fight against him. Yeah. And I meet men in the church all over the place that are just... They think they're supposed to be nice and soft and don't really understand the full ramifications of what we're talking about here. Um, and if men don't step up, and if Christian men don't step up, the problems in our culture are not because people who don't know Christ are acting the way natural men act. It's because Christian men are not standing up and, and doing what God has called and equipped them to do. Um, that is the answer. Um, let's end with this if we can. I, I like this question. Um, uh, what do you say to someone who is without hope? What's your answer to the person who is without hope that needs it? Where do you find it and how do you move toward that? I think to admit you feel hopeless or have a sense of hopelessness is the first and hardest step 
when somebody's willing to say, man, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm done. I don't know what to do. I always, on my program, I encourage people, get honest, get real about where you are. Yeah. So once that's spoken, then by literally the power of God, we have the authority to say, well, here's the good news. It's already been done for you. Yes. Jesus is the only hope in the world. And let me tell you a bit about who my Jesus is. Right. He's your, he can be your Jesus too. Right. Point him to uh, all aspects of who Christ is, not just as we talked earlier, not just the soft, loving, compassionate, forgiving, the, the one that turned over tables, the one that formed a whip, the one that was the greatest man to ever walk the planet. And I always say on my program, by the way, if you read the last book of the Bible, he's not coming back to hug a bunch of people. <laughs> he's coming back to right all wrong. That's right. So less words and more experience about, you know, maybe even sharing where I've come from. Look, if he could do this in my life, oh my goodness, I can't imagine the plan he has for your life. But yeah. you've got to be honest and then you have to be willing to be discipled yeah. and to um, just know that life is really short and eternity is forever and Jesus is king. And right. so talk about hope, man. I don't know what I would do these days with everything going on in the world if I wasn't a follower of him. Yeah, because right. man, it's it's dark out there, but he's he's the light of the world. He said it then, he's gonna be it again very soon. Where can people find out uh, more about you, about the ministry and about KMG? Um, our website is kmgministries.com or if that's a um, little difficult, just franksontag.com. We did that domain name as well. Yeah, uh, We're looking to do more events uh, we are not a church ministry. We're uh, a ministry. We're followers of Jesus. We're yep. kind of warriors and renegades and and pirates and a bunch of other <laughs> guys. But you know, I, I, I um, yeah, kmgministries.com. Yep. Uh, we're praying about a new year, and I'm praying about a, a big change right now. I my prayer is that uh, in the Lord's will to lift me out of radio and have me do this full time because th this is where my heart is. I've done radio 34 years and uh, I can't do two things at once that well, but uh, KMG Ministries is my life and, and I give all the praise and glory to Jesus. It's awesome. Frank, such an honor to talk to you um, and I admire you so much and uh, it's just it's fun to watch what God is doing in your life and I feel such a camaraderie between uh, you and your just kind of your outlook, your philosophy, your worldview and what we do. So. Thank you for everything. Thank you for what you're doing, and thanks for talking. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Keep doing what you're doing, dude. You're a, um, a guiding light to so many men, and I'm, I'm grateful to call you my brother in Christ, and I love you. Thank yes, you for today. Awesome. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for watching or listening, as the case may be. Uh, look forward to connecting with you next time. We'll talk to you later.